good evening. Uh, my name's Simon Longstaff. I'd like to welcome you here tonight to IQ2 Australia, where the Ethics Centre brings civic debate to this iconic Sydney Town Hall. The debate that we're having tonight is on the topic that prisons work. And when you look at the historical reasons why people have been sent to prison, there are four. Deterrence, rehabilitation, community safety, and of course justice, or as some people say, retribution or punishment. But are those reasons still being well served? Given the treatment of juvenile justice inmates in Dondale, if you look at the recidivism rates, violent offences by people who are out on bail, or the over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in our prisons, all of these things have just in this year sparked a number of reviews at the state, territory and national levels. In five years only, the number of people in custody has risen 38% and our prisons are now overpopulated by 10%. But let's not forget as well the victims of crime. More than half of prison inmates are serving time for violent offences like assault, rape and murder. Do we really want to form the view that these people should not be sent to jail? This evening, arguing for the motion, we have Kerry Tucker and Kerry Thompson. Kerry Tucker, the first speaker for the affirmative, was sentenced to seven years and served five of those for stealing money from her employer. She graduated from university while in prison and is now a lecturer and also an advocate for incarcerated women. Joining her, Kerry Thompson, who's acting CEO with the support unit of the Victims of Crime Assistance League, Vocal. She helps victims through emotional issues like trauma, grief and anxiety. Would you please welcome the speakers for the affirmative. And now for the negative, Kerry Mundine and Kerry Burnside. No, <laughs> no Warren and Julian. Uh, Warren Mundine, you will know, he's one of Australia's most high-profile Aboriginal business leaders. He's a managing director of Nyunga Black, an advisory firm, and a former national president of the Australian Labor Party, who recently chaired a South Australian corrections panel that looked at reducing reoffending. And Julian Burnside is an Australian barrister. He's an author and human rights advocate. He's passionate about the arts and well known for his positions on refugees. Julian's legal work is largely in commercial litigation, trade practices and administrative law. Would you please welcome Warren and Julian. <laughs> now, to commence the debate, I call on the first speaker for the affirmative. Please welcome Kerry Tucker. People who commit crimes need to be held accountable for their actions, of course. But the criminal justice system serves a much wider purpose, protecting public safety and the expectation of offender reform. The community has a right to feel safe from the most violent offenders and recidivists, and some crimes demand prison sentences and reflect the harm to the victims. The offender and the community also have the right to expect the experience of incarceration to return healed and reformed offenders to the community. So on that level, I believe there is a need for prisons. Speaking directly to the debate to do prisons work, the unheard contingent of statistics of those people who don't return to prison, the non-recidivist if you will, is always overlooked in favour of high profile failures. Currently nearly half of all offenders will return to prison within two years of their release and currently nearly half won't. These offenders are rarely discussed in the media or in the national discussion in relation to prisons. So more often than not, the discussion on whether prisons actually work is usually based on the failures of the system. Whenever any forum discusses prisons, I believe from the outset it needs to be approached with the absolute understanding that an individual's loss of freedom and the reality of incarceration can never ever be trivialised. My, my argument is twofold, that prisons can act as a social support for women in particular, rightly or wrongly, and how prisons should perform and could perform better. 
is human instinct to punish wrongdoing, and accountability won't and shouldn't vanish from the criminal justice system. We can't just reward people when they do right, but fail to respond when they do wrong. But by shifting the emphasis from retribution to rewards, we can make a greater impact on behaviour. In order to cut crime and recidivism rates, we need to harness what the research says about changing behaviour. That means refocusing the punishment model and making the primary mission of incarceration and supervision to promote success, not just punish failure. And it's the success stories of prisons that often get lost in the noise and outrage of the failures. Many, many offenders after prison claw their way back to a meaningful law-abiding existence in the community, and that in itself is success, and it's a prison success as well. For many women, life behind bars can be a respite from the dysfunction and chaos of reality on the outside, and it can be often the first break from drugs and violence in a very long time. Women offenders tend mostly not to be violent offenders, rather drug-related, and can often be more of a nuisance to society than a threat to society. It also needs to be understood, particularly with the incarcerated population of women, that nearly every one of them were victims of crime before they became perpetrators of crime. That's not an excuse, it's a fact. It's reflected in the correction statistics that identify around 94% of women arriving in prison have come directly from a domestic violence situation prior to or during their offending. Most have a history of rape and childhood sexual abuse. Over 72% of women have been diagnosed with a mental health disorder prior to arriving. With this in mind, sometimes in the isolation of these prison environments, away from their tormentors and abusers, with a focus on self-help positive programs, specific trauma programs and family and children oriented programs, women have a chance to heal and experience a sense of safety and self-worth. Time and again, I personally witnessed middle-aged offenders with mental health issues leave prison on a Friday to a community with no family, no support, no hope of employment and a future of little to no healthy prospects to actively return to prison two days later to a community of women who'd become their family and to a community that offered her more safety than the one outside. Until the healthcare system changes, the prison system will continue to accommodate this population once they offend. This is not to say it's ideal or right, but it is what it is. If we are to imprison people, we have an obligation to each and every human that we do to offer rehabilitation and self-help programs that can rebuild broken people and return them to our communities the best person that they can be. Sometimes people are just so broken from trauma that they've given up from trying to how to work out how to help themselves. Prison can often fill this gap through limit setting and repetition of learning. Investing in the system can help people who can't help themselves. Again, I've personally witnessed the act of incarceration in many cases save the lives of young addicts and provide a prison community and treatment for young addicts that the outside community have long turned their back on. Prison will not rehabilitate or save everyone. One must account for those who are beyond that evil of heart and are an ongoing serious threat to the community but they most definitely do not constitute a majority of the prison population. In my opinion and those of many others who have experienced the prison system, deterrence in sentencing with and within prisons does nothing from the desperate when committing crime. Desperate people make poor decisions without the thought process of planning or even considering deterrence. Their decision is often born out of necessity and desperation. Punishment can only go so far in encouraging good behaviour it loses its effect. Cooperation becomes resistant. One of the most powerful findings recently in criminology is that rewards are better shapers of behaviour than punishments. It's basic human behaviour, the circuitry of motivation. Everyone needs to hear words of encouragement, including those in our criminal justice system. As recent Monash Uni research suggests, in an ideal world, a fairer and safer society with lower rates of offending is likely to be achieved not by criminalising greater numbers of persons with less social capacity, but rather by improving society's capacity to support their most vulnerable members and by reducing inequity in the community.
Unfortunately, this is very idealistic as a community most often supports harsh sentences and employment restrictions once offenders are released. I received this message on Facebook last weekend from someone that I have not met. Hi Kerry, I've just listened to the podcast you did on ABC Radio. Thank you for sharing your experience. It's just what I needed. I too have been incarcerated and now I'm getting on with life. I spent five weeks on remand at the Dame Phyllis Frost Centre. The first week I spent in solitary, I was terrified beyond belief and remorseful as all hell. I had no contact at all with anybody and I was starting to feel just a little bit suicidal and it was a really awful experience. But alas, it changed my life and made me a better mum and a better human. I've gone on to study a certificate for in community services and a diploma in AOD and mental health. It's a welcome time, I feel, to um, change the national conversation about prisons. Thank you. I've lost count of the number of briefings, reviews, and meetings, discussions since over the last two decades, particularly in relation to Indigenous incarceration, but not exclusively. Over a decade ago, I sat on the New South Wales Attorney General's Juvenile Crime Prevention Committee, and, and last year, I chaired the South Australian Strate Strategic Policy Panel for Reducing Reoffending. In 2013, I chaired the New South Wales Minister for Family and Community Services Review into Child Sexual Abuse and uh, breaking a disadvantage report. I was involved in the inquiry in 1998 after the Timula riots and in advocating to the Queensland Government in 2006 on the investigation in the Palm Island death in custody. I also worked closely on the law and order issues when I was in local government. I've received detailed briefings on Indigenous incarceration issues on most of the government's advisory bodies I've sat on. And if you follow my writings, you know I regularly comment on this issue. Let me say at the outset that I'm not here to argue that we should shut down prisons. Unfortunately, there are people in our society that need to be locked up to keep society safe. Frankly, there are some people who I'd be happy to lock up forever and throw away the key. I'm, not soft, I'm no soft, soft touch on when it comes to crime, but that doesn't mean prisons work. Prisons only work if they deliver the outcome we expect of them. So we need to ask what we want prisons to achieve and whether they're achieving it. One outcome that's often claimed is that prisons act as a deterrent. I don't believe that for one simple reason. Most people don't need the threat of prison to stop them committing a murder or an assault or a robbery or a fraud. It's not like most of us are sitting around just itching to rob a bank or punch someone in the face, but hold back because we might go to jail. Most people, most of the time, don't want to commit crimes. When people do, they're usually acting on an overwhelming impulse or emotion, or they think that they won't get caught, or they're just willing to take a risk. The threat of prison isn't top of mind in any of these situations. Another outcome we expect of prisons is to punish offenders and to keep dangerous people off the street. Now, obviously, no one wants to be deprived of their liberty and prisons are not nice places to be in. And obviously, while someone is in prison, they're not in the community, most of the time anyway. However, the vast majority of people in prisons don't sit there for a life. Most pr pr prisoners don't commit the sort of offences that make them going down to the community. And eventually, most prisoners are released, even most of the worst offenders. The punishment prisons dish out and the protection of the general community that prisons provide is therefore limited. But for the argument's sake, let's concede that prisons do punish people and they do keep dangerous people out of the community, at least to an extent. Does that mean that prisons work? If they are the only outcomes we expect, then maybe, but they aren't. Governments spend a small fortune on uh, and other things like vocational and course, skill assessments, education, training and employment programs, psychology and disadvantage, disability services, person, personality and behavioural disorder services, art therapy, chaplaincy services, drug and alcohol treatments, and specific programs for women and Indigenous people. Why? Because the most important outcome we want from prisons is rehabilitation and reducing reoffending. That's why prisons are run by departments called corrective services. And we know that prisons aren't achieving this, they ain't, that they're not working. There are two figures which demonstrate this unequivocally. One is the percentage of prisoners who reoffend or recidivism. Recidivism rates are high, 
For example, nearly half of New South Wales inmates leaving prison will be back within two years. This figure is, isn't exceptional. The figure is the same in South Australia, for instance. The other is the percentage of crimes that are committed by re-offenders, and we know that a high percentage of people who commit criminal offences have been convicted of crimes before. I saw this firsthand when I chaired the South Australian Strategic Policy Panel for Reducing Reoffending last year. No one who saw the information presented to us in the panel would argue that prisons are working. For example, nearly three quarters of those currently in custody in South Australia have been in prison before. In other words, most crimes in South Australia are committed by re-offenders. Again, this is an, is, is an exceptional. The Australian Bureau of Statistics data on the 25th, in, on the 25th of 15 Australian pop, prison population shows that 50% of non-Indigenous prisoners and 77% of Indigenous prisoners have served a private, prior sentence. In fact, reoffending is one of the main reasons that Indigenous people are so disproportionately represented in Australia's prisons. Because people with prior offences are more likely to get a custodian se sentence and to get longer sentences. When I chaired the Prime Minister's Indigenous Advisory Council, we had a presentation of Indigenous incarceration from Don Weatherburn from the New South Wales Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research Commission. I asked him what was the most important thing that we need to be done to reduce Indigenous in re in incarceration. He said, reduce re recidivism. When it comes to juvenile justice, the evidence is not only that prisons don't work, but they make things worse. They are training grounds for criminality. When I sat on the New South Wales Attorney General Juvenile Crime Prevention Committee, we were presented with conclusive research from around the world that showed the same thing. When it comes to juvenile offenders, if you lock them up, you get them for life. If you put them in a diversity program, you most likely never see them again. Juveniles go to prison with almost certain, com certainly commit more crimes and return to prison again and again over their lifetime. The figures were as high as 80%. But if you put juveniles into diversionary programs, the same percentage will likely never offend again. The results are the most, uh, most stark when it comes to juveniles, but even for adults, diversionary programs are cr crucial to preventing recidivism. Comprehensive and targeted rehabilitation is the only way to tackle reoffending. It needs to start as soon as a person walks in the gates of detention, even if they're on remand, and it needs to address the known factors that make reoffending likely. Most importantly, re rehabilitation must include getting people work ready and helping them secure a job. The best programs work with willing employers. When I talk about rehabilit rehabilitation and diversionary programs, I don't mean being soft, quite the opposite. I'm, I mean making offenders clean up their act and get training, education and a job and not, and not giving offenders an opt out. When someone is in the corrective services system, governments have the ability to impose behaviours. They can and should use this ability to turn offenders around, whether the offenders like it or not. Obviously, if the offenders refuse, then prison becomes a fallback. Likewise, there are some crimes where a non-custodial response simply doesn't meet community expectations. But that's not the case for the majority of offenders. Rehabilitation means an offender turning their life around completely, moving from a criminal lifestyle to one that's socially acceptable, with a sense of purpose, resilience, and ultimately self-sufficiency. There are no losers in successful rehabilitation, whether you're a bleeding heart lefty or a hardline conservative. It is in our best interest everyone wants prisoners to be re rehabilitated and stop reoffending. Prisons aren't delivering this, and this, is, this needs to be changed. Thank you very much. For a victim of crime, the aftermath of a violent assault is life-changing. Physical health suffers long after any injuries have healed. Psychologically, you may develop anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, or even complex trauma. Hypervigilance sees you on alert for danger, and you may grapple with nightmares and flashbacks for many, many years. Work suffers. How can you effectively function when you haven't slept? you're on edge, or you're distracted. Yet, how can you pay the bills when you're unable to work? Life, as you once knew it, has changed forever, and naturally we look to the legal system to make things right, to protect us from further harm. Realistically, no one ever plans to become a victim of crime. No one plans that when they get a morning coffee that they'll be part of a terrorist siege or an armed hold-up. <laughs> 
No one plans that when they drive home from work that they'll be hit by a drunk driver. No one plans that when they go out at night that they'll be glassed or stabbed or king hit or sexually assaulted. But all of these crimes do happen and they happen often in our community. They have a detrimental and ongoing impact, not only on the victim, but the victim's family, their friends, their work colleagues, and the community. Prisons work because most people go through life understanding that if you break the law, there will be consequences, and prison is a consequence. Yet repeat offenders seem to disregard our laws, as well as the safety and well-being of other people, and under Australian laws, prisons act as a form of punishment for their criminal behaviour. I worked with a lady who was trying to leave a domestic violent relationship. Her husband had a long history of criminal and violent behaviour, including assaulting police. When she tried to leave him, he assaulted her so badly that he shattered her eardrum, punctured her lung and broke her ribs. His punishment for this crime was prison. Another client was asleep next to his girlfriend in her unit and in the lounge room, another couple was sleeping after they've had a night out. The offender, an ex-boyfriend of one of the females, broke into the home and shot both men in the head while they slept. His punishment was prison. If society has no serious punishment for crime and wrongdoing, more people would do the wrong thing. As of March this year, there are around 13,000 people in New South Wales prisons and the numbers continue to rise. Yet over the past 12 months, 60% of this increase in numbers are linked to offenders who have been denied bail. That means that they've been assessed by the courts as posing an unacceptable risk of harm to the community. Prisons are working to keep our society safe. Yes, prisons are expensive, but so is the cost of responding to crime outside of prison walls, and so is the cost on our healthcare system, who helps victims of crime recover after trauma. In 2015, the CEO of the Crimes Commission, Mr Chris Dawson, acknowledges that we cannot put a financial price on the way violent crimes ruin lives. It tears families apart and it devastates communities. Take, for example, Demetrius Gargousilis, the Melbourne man who, a week after he was granted bail for other violent offences, drove his car through Burke Street Mall and killed and injured completely innocent people. Such violent crimes offend society. Prisons work not only to punish offenders, but to isolate them from the law-abiding community. A prison sentence also provides justice to victims of crime and for the people that I work with, their need for justice is often at the core of their recovery. I've worked with a lady who was repeatedly beaten and sexually assaulted by a stranger. The jury found him guilty and upon hearing the verdict, my client broke down in tears. The rawness of her grief, shame and trauma was heartbreaking. Learning of his prison sentence, she was not concerned with how long he was going to be in prison for. Her response was, he's away from society now and that's all that matters. He can't do this to another woman. Walking away from the courthouse, knowing that your trauma has been validated and acknowledged by the legal system is so incredibly important to a victims of crime recovery process. I've worked with a family whose mother was murdered by a family acquaintance and despite the crime happening away from the family home and the offender being sentenced for over 20 years in prison, the young children still remain petrified that someone will break into their home and kill them as well. Innocent lives are shattered by violent crimes. In this case, the father feels that the prison sentence has provided them with a sense of justice. Sometimes, he says, this is all he has to hold on to as he tries to comfort his grieving children. I have also seen firsthand that prisons can work for offenders who are willing to change their behaviours. 
At times, I've worked with male victims of childhood sexual abuse who have, in the past, been in prison for other low to mid-range offences. While their ages range between 22 and age 55, a striking commonality between these men is that they report that being incarcerated gave them the time to think about what they did, why they did it, and where to from now. A 23-year-old male on parole said to me just recently, I've spent time in and out of prison since I was 15 years old, but only once did I speak to a prison psychologist. I told her that I had been abused from a, by a family member, but I didn't get any help. This time, he says, all I had to do was sit in prison and think, and I want to change the direction of my life now. I don't want to go back in there. Under our current legal system, an alleged offender has rights. They have the right to silent and the right to legal representation. But no one has the right to harm another person. Prisons work to, co to protect the community and ensure that we are safe from further violent potential harm. Prisons provide justice to victims of crime whose lives have been horrendously impacted by criminal behaviours. Prisons do work for people who are willing to change their behaviour. But most of all, prisons provide real consequences for violent and dangerous criminal behaviours. Thank you. Simon Longstaff uh, accurately identified the purposes of uh, the criminal justice system and punishment in particular to deter, uh, to rehabilitate, to provide for community safety and as punishment. Now punishment has figured largely in the analysis by the two Kerrys. Punishment, however, is not necessarily confined to the idea of prison. People are sent to prison as punishment, not for punishment. They're not supposed to be mistreated in prison. The idea of putting them in prison has two purposes. First, to protect society from people who are uncontrollably dangerous. And second, uh, in the hope that the uh, person who is held in prison is being punished by virtue of being there. But uh, what about deterrence? What about rehabilitation? No evidence whatever from that side to suggest that it works for either of those purposes. Now, of course, if a dangerous, violent criminal is in jail, then the community is protected from them for the time that they're in jail. Well, duh, you don't have to be a genius to work that out. Um, but what about people sentenced for, for example, three months or six months or 12 months? What's the point? If they are uncontrollably dangerous, what's the point of sending them away for just that short time? Now, what about the other two purposes of punishment? Um, rehabilitation and reducing crime. It is not the purpose of punishment to exact revenge. And yet, in those who would see more and more punishment, there is an instinct for revenge at work. Um, the, the system for punishment, and I was very interested in Kerry number two talking about this, punishment, uh, prison as punishment, is not the only method of punishment that's available. We used to have hanging, drawing and quartering. Then we decided that was a bit tough. Then we had the electric chair. We decided that was a bit tough. So now deprivation of liberty is the way, the harshest way we punish. But prisons are not the only way to do that. I was very interested in Kerry number one saying that the recidivism rate is about 50%, and I agree, that is about the rate. Well now, does that mean that prisons are working? If your car only started 50% of the time, would you say that was a car that worked? It's, 
astonishing to think that a system can be so faulty. When it comes to the time for question and answer, ask Kerry Tucker whether she got any real rehabilitation while she was in prison for five years. Ask whether she got any education or training that was useful while she was in prison for five years. Ask how much it costs to keep someone in prison for five years. It's roughly $200,000 per year. That's the price which the community pays for a system that does not work. Now, um, one of the most important ways of uh, making sure that people don't engage in repeat crimes is to make sure that they are sufficiently trained or educated that they will be able to get a worthwhile job once their punishment is ended. It's also important to bear in mind that at the moment, if a person fronts up for a job with uh, a prison term on their CV, it's probably not going to help them get employed. And what's the consequence of that? The consequence is they're driven back into the criminal system. The point is that education and training are an essential part of any deprivation of liberty as punishment. Um, the, the difficulty with that, of course, is that once you go easy, once you deal with people in a sensible way who've committed crimes, the tabloid press will be all over you complaining about turning, turning the prisons into holiday camps. But let's have a look at some alternatives that will achieve the objectives of deterring people from committing crime, of rehabilitating them, and of um, punishing them, punishing them by depriving them of their safety. What about systems like uh, house detention, house arrest, which can be enforced by ankle bracelets? It may not seem as unpleasant as sending them to prison, but it gives you the opportunity of using those people whilst they're tied to their home, it gives you the opportunity of giving them further educational training and thus suiting them to fall back into the community once their detention is finished. Um, what about the idea of coupling house arrest with compulsory community service? Someone like Kerry Tucker, for example, who would be excellent at making sure that other criminals could get the sort of training which they need to ensure that they will not go back into crime. People like Kerry Thomas, for example, who could use their time in prison to help victims of crime. Absolutely, undeniably worthwhile ideas. But people who've been convicted of a crime who are going to be punished by being deprived of their freedom are still useful human beings, people with salvage in them, people who can be trained further, people whose time can be used, whose skills can be used to do something effective for the community. The fact is that beyond the need to keep dangerous, violent people out of circulation, prisons do not work. And we are spending ludicrous amounts of money being unpleasant to people because underneath the surface, there is a desire for vengeance. It's got no role to play. Do not ever confuse the desire to keep people out of, to deny them their freedom. Never confuse that with a desire for vengeance. Um, we, uh, the fact is that if a person is denied their freedom by house arrest and the obligation to commit, to carry out community service, those two are consequences of the sort that Kerry Thomas would support. Those are consequences which may enable people not only to experience a deprivation of their liberty, but to make sure that when their time is up, they will be able to get back into the community and do things that are worthwhile for all of us. Let's take vengeance out of us. That's all prisons are worth. They're just vengeance. Thank you. So the, the figures I'm going to give you are what you thought before you heard any of these arguments, and it'll help us later on to see how things have shifted. So before we started, well, you started off with a pretty small number. You only had 11% <laughs> at the beginning. So 
You've got a bit of a hill to climb. <laughs> uh, 11% for, 60% against, and 29% undecided. So as before, though, you've got to wait now to get the final result when everyone votes. It's a good start, yeah. Um, my name's Tori Edwards. I'm from a legal organisation, not-for-profit, called Justice Connect, which I should acknowledge that Julian's a patron of. Um, one thing we know from our work at Justice Connect is that there are really strong links between homelessness, offending behaviour and re-offending behaviour, and it's not something that the panel's addressed tonight. But to frame that with a bit of a data, I suppose, a 2012 study by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare found that 35% of prisoners going into prison were homeless and 43% of prisoners coming out of prison were released into homelessness. Um, given we've got really strong data, other studies say that people released into homelessness are up to twice as likely to re-offend and end up back in prison within nine months of release. Given there's this really strong data, my question really to any of the panel is what role, if prisons were really working, should they be playing in addressing um, issues that would mean that people were being um, released into secure and safe housing and more easily able to be reintegrated into the community? Okay. Thanks. Um, do you want to start, Kerry, on, on homelessness and, and the whole business around housing? Yeah, I think um, being released um, to secure housing is always a problem because there aren't you know, sufficient support in, this, in the community for that. Um, and that will obviously lead back to, um, to, to re-offending. So homelessness, I don't know how that will affect prison. I do know that when people go into prison, um, they come out of that sort of situation. So obviously there's a direct link there, but I, I, I can't answer that as far as um, other support services in the community with secure housing. That, that seems to be the main problem. Warren? Yeah, look, you hit on a really uh, important area. From the research we did into the South Australian uh, reoffending system, if, if w prisoners were released and they didn't have housing within days, and I'm talking about days, not weeks or months, they, were, uh, they committed crime and was back in, in the prison system again. And so housing plays an important role. So what the recommendation, one of the recommendations we've made was that there has to be an assessment done a full assessment on anyone coming into the correctional services. That means people on remand, people who are on home detention, as well as people who are sentenced to prison. Uh, looking at the uh, mental health issues, looking at accommodation, looking at training and skills, employment, and so on. And then case managing them through the, through the, through the system until, and even beyond it. So looking at probably a year to a year and a half after they left the, the correctional services system. Now, talk, deliberately use the term correctional services rather than prisons because we were looking at wider ranges of how to, how to deal with uh, criminality and, and recidivism. And so housing plays a massive, massive important area in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll go down microphone one. You want to have a go? You're keen there. You've grabbed it already. So I think it's on. You, you, it just turns on if you start speaking. Okay. Um my question is to Kerry Tucker. <laughs> Kerry, I'm sitting here next to a young man who has been through the judicial system, through the criminal justice system, ever since he was a young lad. He's been abused through that system horrendously, and you're arguing that prisons work. You're arguing that violent abuse from prison guards will work, that this will make people better, that this will make people change. You think your experiences in prison made you a better person? Vicky, in response, um, I, I have to say that, you know, I can't speak for, for the men's prisons or the yeah. youth prisons and whatnot. I can only exp um, speak to the women's prison. And the women's prison certainly wasn't a, a, a violent place there. It was much more of um, a community of women looking after other women, so... Can I just ask, were you there around the same time? Is that...? Yep. We were best friends. OK. <laughs> Maybe not now. <laughs> 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 right. We'll, we'll, we'll try and put a hold on the, the, those individuals. Thanks. I think you've asked some really important questions, which I promise we'll keep coming back to, particularly around violence and things like that. But before we do, I'd just like to ask um, microphone four, if you want to have a go. 
My name is Lise Lafferty. Um, I, I just have a question. A lot of you have talked about, like Carrie, you talked about how women in prison who use drugs, they may get rehabilitation in prison, but there's also a lot of people who enter prison who get exposed to drugs and start using. Um, and then there was a lot of talk about how prison is intended to be a deterrent, but that doesn't always work. And there are a number of ways in which prison has failed people. And I'm wondering if people are talking about the ways in which the community has failed offenders before they go in. And do we need to take more accountability and responsibility as a community and as a society to help people not go into prison and to not get that tick box when they leave prison to try and get a job, to try and make a new life for themselves, but they have to carry that baggage of incarceration. Okay, so the role of the community in this, Julian, I'm going to ask you in partly to, sorry, is it Vicky? Yes. Yeah, Vicky's question about, I mean, the violence that takes place, because I think you were saying that if vengeance or punishment of that kind is part of what prisons are meeting up, they're failing their basic test. So can you comment on both of those points? One about if this is a, the thing that you have in mind, and also where the community's responsibility for what happens in these institutions and before them actually lies. The sort of episodes which you spoke about sound like the result of mismanagement of prisons. Uh, but if, if the point of imprisonment is to deprive a person of their freedom, not to expose them to vicious conduct by other prisoners, then we should, or, or, or prison officers, um, then we should think of more creative ways of depriving people of their freedom. And ha house, hang on, hang on, house arrest uh, secured by ankle bracelets is an effective way of doing that. Uh, now, it may not be as nasty as prison, but the point is that prisons do have a 50% recidivist rate. What's the point? What's the point of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to lock a person up when they come back because they've committed another offence, because they've been brutalised by the experience? Why not use the deprivation of liberty as an occasion for improving their capacity to fit usefully into the community that they've been taken out of? That's so what, and, and the point the about the, com point. the community's responsibility for all of this? That is the question... I, I'm not sure the community can, community can be held responsible for the fact that there's violence in prisons, although I suppose... Or the circumstances if, which lead if, people to prison. Well, I mean, it's the prison, it's the prison uh, environment that leads to it, and the community seems to be perfectly content with that. If the community collectively said, OK, prisons do not work, except to keep people out of circulation, then maybe we'll do a lot better. And that we know the fact of the way prisons operate, and if we're not prepared to take responsibility for that, then presumably we turn our blind eye to it because we Ger don't Gary mind Thompson. vengeance. Jerry? Yeah. yeah, I work with um, any victim of any crime. Um, the only um, crime type that people, that, that my clients are against sending offenders to prison for is family violence and that's um, usually the the people I see with there they are mainly women but we do have male victims of family violence as well um, they will come in um, repeatedly there have been numerous reports to police that the offender would be in and out of the judicial judicial system um, and and the clients still report back to me and to other agencies, to police, I don't want him to go to jail. I don't want him, I just want him to get help. He's got anger management issues. He, he's only like this when he drinks. He's got a drug problem. So um, that's the only crime type that I've worked with where, where people will try and surround that person with counselling, um, uh, health assistance, drug and alcohol counselling. But what we tend to find is that if if the offender, the alleged offender, is willing to participate in that um, assistance, engage with other services, then that's great. But often, there's, um, we see that he says he doesn't have an alcohol problem, he doesn't have a problem with drugs. Um, so there is a bit of resistance, but family violence is pretty much the only, only crime type that 
I work with where repeatedly victims say, please, I don't want him to go to jail. Let's go to microphone two and then we'll go to three. Two. When I came in, I, uh, I voted for the against. Uh, but in listening to the, uh, to the uh, argument being put for, it's not a simple for or against issue. It's much more complicated than that. It, it appears as though the experience for women is very different than it is for men. There's a lot less violence. And it seemed to me, as you said, there are a lot of contributing factors that have uh, almost forced women into that position. Also, in the, in the case of men, there's a clear difference between violence, where people are simply dangerous, uh, and those who are not violent. And obviously, there should be different ways of dealing with that. Um, so I think for or against prison, it's, it's just too simple. Um, and I've been persuaded more for the four because I like the way that uh, the arguments okay. was, were thank, presented. Thank you. And please clap people when they give you their opinion, yeah. even if you don't agree yeah. with it. Uh, microphone three. Hi, um, my name is Louise. I actually had a question about um, domestic violence perpetrators and victims. I was really shocked by the statistic that the first speaker brought up about the amount of women in prison that are affected by domestic violence. So obviously it has such a massive impact and is such a fraught issue when we're talking about prisons. Um, I couldn't help but think but during Julian's argument about alternative strategies that obviously um, home detention is not an appropriate punishment. So um, I was wondering what the against thoughts about domestic violence perpetrators um, and their punishment is. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, look, Warren or Julian, I mean, I think Kerry might say, have said, and as the question is putting, the last place you want to yeah. be sent if you're subject to domestic violence is back home with an ankle bracelet on. Uh, the, yeah, well, obviously <laughs> you wouldn't want to put them back in the environment in which they committed the initial offence. But it's interesting that Kerry Thompson said domestic violence are the offences where the people do not want to see the person go to prison. Um, now, if a person needs to be deprived of their freedom as punishment, then let's think of more creative ways of doing it than throwing them into a place where they will not come out improved in most instances and will end up going back into jail in 50% of instances. Uh, we need to be creative about it. That's the simple point. Because if jails have a 50% recidivism rate, then it's clear they do not work. Okay. They're not achieving their purposes. Warren, do you want to add something? Yeah, sure. This area of domestic violence, one of the things that hit me for all the reviews, all the reports that I've done over the last 20 years, is the incredible statistics about sexual abuse, uh, abuse, uh, physical abuse, mental abuse, uh, domestic violence issues uh, that happen, which lead to these uh, young juveniles going to detentions. In fact, most of the juveniles you'll find one of the things that you'll see coming out of the Don Dale review is most of those boys, in fact, all of those boys that are in those detention centres have been sexually abused prior to that. And then if you look at the social breakdown within uh, Indigenous communities, for example, uh, we're looking at 77% residual uh, uh, recidivism happening and you're looking at the number of people that are going through, the, the, the statistics are just going through the roof and women... The, the growth in women uh, going into the, uh, prisons, uh, and it's all to do with these social issues that are happening, socioeconomic issues that are happening back in their communities. So if society is going to do something, then it's uh, in regard to this. It has to be about how do we approach the socioeconomic uh, uh, standing of people in the communities, as well, looking at jobs, looking at education, looking at a, uh, a training, looking at accommodation, because that plays a major role in these, these issues and that, and also the social dysfunction that happens. And, a, and a, 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 we have to confront these issues and have honest discussion about it uh, otherwise, uh, these, these things will only get worse. I just wanted to say to Julian, I was very pleased to see Eddie O'B go to jail. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering if schadenfreude is actually another reason for punishment. <laughs> but 
the question I wanted to ask was, what percentage of people who go to jail have a mental illness before they enter jail, uh, including something like fetal alcohol syndrome or lead poisoning? And do those people go to jail uh, as justified punishment for choosing the wrong parents? Okay. Um, yeah. Hold that thought. Um, microphone four. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Vittles. I'm a curious citizen. Uh, in the spirit of uh, a debate, I'd like to ask a question. I'd like to emphasize this is not a personal view. Um, listening to the four team focusing on punishment and protection, and listening to the against team telling us about how poorly prisons perform in achieving the goal of rehabilitation and uh, poor return on taxpayer resources, um, is the answer to remove rehabilitation as a purpose and then prisons work? <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that deserves a clap. Bony fail if you're trying to rehabilitate. Uh, microphone three. Hi, my name is Brendan Order. Um, I just want to say thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to listen to it. Um, my question's for the affirmative. Um, with the arguments that you brought forth, can you apply those arguments to the juvenile defence defense system and do they still hold up or would you cross the floor when discussing youth and juvenile detention? Okay, so Kerry Thompson, yeah. this yeah. is a fantastic thing. We'll come back to the other questions. Yeah. When you think about young people, and it actually goes a little bit into that thing about fetal alcohol syndrome, oh. yeah. surely prisons don't work for young people. I mean... You're not, you, are you going to argue that they do? I'm or? not going to argue. I don't, I don't think that they do work for, for young people. I think that um, we need to be t talking more about... We need to be talking more about um, trauma-informed care for children who are either raised in family violence, who are exposed... Uh, um, participating in criminal behaviour, drug abuse, we need to put more support around them at the time that they need it, rather than um, sending them to jail straight away. Um, uh, let, let her answer. Thank you. Keep going. Um, ad address the, the, uh, the trauma that they may be experiencing that may lead them to offending behaviour. Um, <clears throat> Kerry, okay. any thoughts? Yeah, I, look, I agree. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know anyone that would support children going to a uh, to a prison environment. It certainly doesn't encourage growth. It's 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 a place for adults. It's certainly not for for the juvenile. I've never seen anything good come out of it, so I certainly couldn't support it. And on the issue of the incidence of mental health causing things in young people, and also the question of let's do away with rehabilitation as an yeah. aim, and just go for retribution, Julian. Um, well, I think the idea of just going for retribution um, also would support an argument to reintroduce the death sentence, which I do not agree with. Um, if, if we regard ourselves as a civilised society, then every we need to understand, and I address this rather to the person who asked the question at microphone one, all crime has its cause. We may not know the cause, we may not be able to fix the cause, but we can try. And I think rehabilitation ought to be a primary objective of any form of punishment because if we don't try and rehabilitate things, we're not going to improve society at all. Okay. Pu punishment and vengeance do not improve society. Okay. Microphone, very briefly, Just Warren. Very quickly on the, on the rehabilitation stuff, it, it is, uh, we, we really have to win this battle in regard to rehabilitation because if we can stop a person from committing uh, another crime, recidivism, we're going to resolve two-thirds of crime within our community. Mm -hmm. Two-thirds of crime within our community is through recidivism. So if we're going to break that down and stop victims of the future, we need to have rehabilitation working. But with yeah, Kerry, jump in there. Sorry, yeah. with, with rehabilitation, it, it's, it's all good to say, yes, we've got the programs and yes, we've got the, the money for it in whatever settings, whether it's in prisons or um, supervision in a correction, correctional services settings. Um, but my, my experience and my argument is, is what if people don't recognise that they have a problem? It, with family violence, for instance, there's, there's a lot of entrenched beliefs around violence, around values, around attitudes to women, and around power imbalance in general. 
Um, some offenders don't want to look at that. They don't see that that's a problem. So putting them into a rehabilitation course or setting or things like that, um, I wonder how that, that would work for people who don't believe that they've got a problem. My name is Stephanie. I'm a nurse and I worked in the jails in New South Wales from 1990 to 2015. My point is most people in prison are not bad people. They may have broken the law. I don't agree that jails are the right place for most of them, most of the time. However, when they're in jail, they film their own community. They are good people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Microphone for, yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah. Hi, my name's Owen. Um, first of all, I'd just like to um, share that I, 20 years ago, spent uh, 11 months in prison of a three-year three sentence for a very serious violent crime. That was um, absolutely enough for me to um, change the way I live my life and decide not to go back. And so from my personal experience, I would say prisons do work. Um, there was not much chance that I was going to change the um, trajectory of my life without that kind of intervention. Did you experience some of the, because there's been this discussion about men's yeah. prisons, did you experience the violence that Vicky was talking about? I did not experience. Um, there, was, there was violence amongst inmates. There was, I did not witness or experience any violence from uh, the guards or any of the staff in that men's prison, which was a maximum security prison. Um, but what I would say, the, the topic tonight is whether prisons work but we've heard a lot of talk about Australian prisons and I wonder um, if we look to out, outside uh, Australia, if we look at like the Dutch um, example, they have a very um, different way of treating their prisoners. They treat their prisoners in a far more, more humane way. They treat them as people. They provide far more support and as a result they have way, way lower recidivism rates. Thank you. And they are actually closing prisons because even though they've had increases in crime, yep. the recidivism rate is going down. Okay, thank you. Mm, yep. yep. Julian. I, I think that's a very, very useful observation. And um, while I can't speak of the Dutch experience, I can tell you that in America, the recidivism rate for people imprisoned is 60%. So they only do what they're meant to do. They only work in 40% of cases, and that's catastrophic. It likewise in okay. Indonesian prisons. It's Microphone three. Uh, Dean Lloyd, um, to the Kerrys. Uh, given that the vast majority of people are going to get out of prison, um, can you name how many per capita rehabilitative beds there are in the prison system um, and coming from a personal experience uh, when I was released from prison uh, with $50 and a handshake and I wasn't able to get a job for over 10 years because I had a criminal record, how has prison served me and I still can't get a, a job, a government job and I'm just unaware of how prison stops PTSD. Kerry, do you want to yeah. respond? Yeah, um, and look, that's a good point. And I think criminal, the whole criminal record um, system needs to be looked in as well, you know, because that to me is a double sentence. So I do agree with that. If you get out of prison, you should be able to get out and just walk free. You've done your time. You've, you've, as they say, you've done the crime, you've done the time. I don't think criminal record checks should be applicable um, only in, this, in the circumstance where if maybe you're for serious offending or if you're doing the same sort of work, you know, um, because it is a, a double sentence. PTSD, I'm, look, I can't sort of speak to that. We have the Dame Phyllis Frost Centre in Victoria, I would say, is probably one of the largest mental health facilities there. Okay, thank you. Now, what I'm going to do is, you might remember, before the debate, 29% undecided, so you might have picked up a few of those. <laughs> you had a rather sad 11% when you started, and you had 60% already going for you. So now we're going to find out what happened. Well, the undecided are down to... 15%. You've picked up a good chunk of those, okay? But I'm afraid to say that the four side has risen to 
and the against side has won the debate with 64%, so I declare that the motion is lost. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your participation. You won, Vicky, you won. Uh, can you please join me in thanking all of our speakers, Kerry Tucker, Kerry Thompson, Warren Mundine, and Julian Burnside. Thank you so much for your contribution. I'm Simon Longstaff from the Ethics Centre. Thanks for coming tonight. It's goodbye from me and everybody here from IQ2 Australia.